guys! Today's video will be a bit different. Uh, not a whole lot of cute stuff, but a whole lot of talking. Um, I have got sent in so many questions and I decided to pick five and answer those today and we'll do another Q&A shortly, probably in a couple weeks time. The first question today is one that I have been asked a whole lot um, prior to birth and a whole lot after. So before the puppies were born, people kept asking, are you afraid about uh, Venus being protective and Mojo being scared? Are you afraid of Mojo protecting the puppies? Are you afraid of Mojo not accepting it? Um, yes, I was curious. I was very curious um, to see how she would react to the situation. Great start. The battery died already halfway in the first question. Um, yeah, so, and then the question that I've been getting most um, since the puppies have been here is does Mojo accept them? How is she dealing with it? Now, I already explained most of that in an Instagram post because I was very impressed with how it's all going. Um, yeah, Mojo is dealing with it so well and that's when we came back from the vet's office after um, the C-section. That's what we were curious about as well. We didn't know how she would respond and if we would, if we could keep her in uh, the same room or that we would have to keep her in the bedroom because this is a one bed apartment um, or maybe put her in a crate in the same room as Venus but no, um, Venus um, is in a pen in the um, with the whelping box in it and um, Mojo could hence not reach um, them the first day but um, we saw that Venus was so normal towards Mojo uh, that whenever we're in the same room we keep the pen open so Venus can go in and out, have her own rhythm and uh, Mojo doesn't enter. Um, she does occasionally enter but that's uh, just to inspect and Venus is completely fine with that as well. So it, it's, <laughs> it's actually gone a lot better than we would have thought. Um, so yeah, we're very happy with that um, because it means that it's not just um, okay for Venus but also Mojo is stress-free because for Mojo obviously this is something that's completely out of her um, doing. Um, for Venus there have been a lot of changes, her body was prepared for all of this but for Mojo it's just a, a random six extra dogs in the house but she's actually shown a lot of interest and I think she will be great, um, she will be a great part in raising the puppies as well. So. Actually, it's been great fun for her and um, yeah, uh, she, she's loving it and I'm loving the way she's handling it and uh, she's super respectful towards the puppies by the way, so she um, she sniffs from a distance and she doesn't touch them, she, she just sniffs them, just inspects them, so um, yeah, we'll see how she does when the pups are out of the pen. Um, they they have been exploring a whole lot um, these days so I think in a couple days time um, they will start interacting with Mojo and Venus a lot so I'll film that obviously and you will see that in the vlogs coming up but um, yeah then then you will finally see exactly how this is going then the big question that came from a group of people who are not excited about the fact that we are uh, breeding a litter, raising a litter, is why all the shelters are full. Um, this is a tough one because, well, because of the whole adopt don't shop uh, thingy. Let me explain it this way. The shelters are full in some countries, they are not full in all countries. There are lots of stray dogs in some countries, some countries there are none. Um, and there are kill shelters in some countries, they are not in every country, not to be found in every country. Now, people who say adopt, don't shop, often also say that you have to spay and neuter your dog and you cannot um, raise a litter. Um, should that be put into full effect, there will not be any dogs in 15 years, let alone dogs who are structurally sound, uh, healthy, and of whom we know what their past is. 
Now, there are many people who use dogs for working, so that, mean, uh, that, that means service dogs, dogs in the police force, in the army, um, but there are many other forms of working dogs or sporting dogs as well, not just um, dogs who are actively used in duty, whichever that may be, but also dogs um, that are used for leisure. Um, and that's kind of where these dogs come in. Um, people who are interested in the pups that we are raising, <clears throat> and that's the homes that they will be going to, are people who um, whose hobby it is to spend a lot of time sporting with their dogs. And dogs who are bred without a purpose, just accidentally, often, or without any knowledge about their lineage and whatever is behind them, their behaviour, um, are not are often not suitable for these sports. Uh, also, in my opinion, dogs that should have never existed. Um, so, saying dog don't shop, there is a third category. In the Netherlands, for example, you don't have a shop where you can buy dogs. You don't have a shop where you can buy cats. The most we can buy at certain stores are parakeets and rabbits. That's about it. Some rodents as well. Um, but you can't buy a dog here for nothing. You can adopt them, um, but you can also find a, a poor breeder or a good breeder. And that's where you go, adopt, shop or buy responsibly. So we um, are putting a lot of money and time, you don't even want to know how much time I use to do this correctly, into these dogs, into nursing Venus, Venus nursing them. Um, and a lot of effort and a lot of knowledge, 30 years of knowledge in this specific uh, ninth generation, um, that it's something completely different. And you cannot compare um, shopping uh, with buying a dog from a responsible breeder. Now, should we not breed anymore, there will not be any healthy dogs and that's why we are breeding. We want to keep the breed alive. We cannot, for example, if you go and think about breed specific rescues and they say we should not be breeding, but they are also interested in that specific breed. You cannot keep a breed the way it is without responsible breeders, without people who have the knowledge. Um, so yeah, that's kind of my point, of, uh, point on this. Um, if your opinion is different, I understand. Um, and we can definitely have a chat about that in the comments, but why? This is why. Then an interesting question as well um, that came up when the puppies were born and introduced. Um, everyone saw that the pups were similar to Venus. Now there's actually only one puppy who is fawn, like Venus is, but their colour will change a lot when they're older, so um, they will all get a lot darker. There's one fawn puppy, the one that's going to my friend, um, and the rest is red, uh, various um, shades of red, but they're all darker than the other one. But the sire of the litter, the father of the, of the pups, is um, is pied. He's, he has a lot of white with uh, a few spots. The spots are incredibly dark, so he's a very dark red, heavy pigment, uh, heavy pigmentation. And uh, people were wondering if we knew in advance which colour the pups would be. Um, yes, we did, and no, we did not. Basically, what this litter could offer us was um, every shade of fawn and red. So everything that ranged from light fawn to dark red. Um, and then we, um, we expected the sable to come in, so the backs and the tails that are a bit darker. Um, and the dark mask is also something we expected. So all of the pups have darker features around the nose and the ears and they have a darker um, back. But they could also have um, basically any pattern. So we could have Irish spotted, which is um, white around the chest and neck and white on the paws, or pied, or um, well, in, in every form of ext extremity, because Freddy, the father, is very extremely pied. Um, basically an all-white dog with two 
red spots on his back and then Venus who is almost completely solid uh, form. Now we happen to have um, six, uh, six solid pups with some white markings, white chests, but you do have variations in uh, how far the white goes down on the chest and that actually also influences the color. So two of the pups, um, Colt and one other pup, they have white all the way down to the belly and they are also the darkest red pups. Um, there's one pup who is heavy sable, um, lighter red than the others, but um, very dark tail and very dark back. Um, so it, it, even though they look the same to everyone, they are very different. And that actually brings us to the fourth question, and that's how do you keep the pups apart? How do you know who is who? Um, that was difficult the first few days. Um, especially when we were weighing the pups, um, we we knew who was Colt because he has a cleft lip and he's male. Then we knew another one because she was fawn, and another because she has very interesting markings on her belly. It's almost like a circle on the belly. But the three others were were all red, and um, they all had white until the same level of the chest. So what we did was we counted their toes. So um, how many white toes on which front paws they had. Um, and that's how we kept them apart. Then after a short while we saw that one pup uh, had no white on the upper jaw and another had a white stripe just below the uh, leathery part of the nose and one other had a speckly nose, a butterfly nose. Now these butterfly noses, by the way, they are now spotty. They're all filling in. That's kind of how it develops. Um, some butterfly noses do not develop. Like Freddy, he has a bit of white on his nose still, which is not desirable in the breed. Um, that's also why I'm keeping a good eye on the noses to see how they develop um, week to week. So we can see in the future which dogs these dogs will be combined with. Because um, it's very important to know. Um, but they're all filling in nicely, so they should all have a black nose in time. But um, the butterfly noses on adult dogs you see on Merle dogs or Harlequin, Great Danes, dogs like that, they often have a spotty nose. Uh, but in Staffords, that not, that's not something you often see and it's not something you should see. The nose should be a different colour, black in this case. And then the fifth question, which is the final one for today and which is, I think, the most interesting thing and which is also something I am not really a part in, but it's something that Marco does, the breeder himself. And the question is, how is it possible to determine which home, which puppy will go to so early in life? Now, usually Marco determines this uh, upon birth and this is because when Marco does a combination of two dogs, he knows that what he can expect. It's not necessarily the behavior of the parents and the, um, the structure of the parents that's of influence, but you can also go back in generations quite far. And in this case, the behavior that we see is not similar to Venus, but it's similar to Freddy and to Venus's ancestors. And that's what we expected with this uh, quite open pedigree. We expected that we would see a specific type of character that um, was found quite a few generations back in Venus's uh, line. And um, so he knows uh, an average, a broad range of what to expect. And that means that he has a couple of people in mind already. And then upon birth, there is always a difference in behavior. The pups that go to, uh, that find the milk quickest have the highest drive, the highest um, will to live, the highest desire. Now, obviously, Venus didn't give birth naturally, naturally but the puppies still have specific behavior. Um, now, they're all quite feisty, um, but there's, for example, one pup who sleeps a bit more, who is a lot more chilled um, and also drinks for way longer. Then there are two pups who are um, often on their own, so they um they choose to sleep on their own or they choose to sleep at the edge or they choose these two sleep together quite often, they play together quite often um, and the other three, when they, four sorry, when they would be lifted, so the ones who would never sleep alone, when you would lift them they would freak out, then they would slowly calm down and when you would put them back they would freak out again. So that's behaviour that shows that they are less independent 
more dependent on people, um, most likely. And it kind of depends on the owner what they are looking for, what they, what they like. Um, some people like a dog that's more attention seeking. Can you hear Mojo snoring? And some people really like a dog that likes to explore on their own and they don't need you. Um, and we knew, for example, that Anka, my friend, really appreciates a dog who can basically enjoy life on their own, who can enjoy walking around in, in the yard. Um, and that's also one of her Staffords at home. He's just like that. And that's the type of behavior that she loves. So we knew that this one particular pup was perfect for her, but she also had a click with her when she saw her. She liked the appearance. Um, so everything about the pup spoke to her. So that's why we picked her dog that way. Um, then the other four pups, that's up, up to the breeder. He will be here shortly, so um, he will make a decision on where they will be going. Now with regards to cold, um, that's something I'm discussing with Marco together, where we will be um, rehoming him because he's actually just like the other dog very independent very strong very strong willed but very calm as well in his own way so that's actually quite a lovely behavior he also has a very different type of body um, something I really like and something the breeder likes as well um, but he can never be bred so that's quite a different situation um, so we'll see where he goes but yeah that's how Marco does it he I know of a couple people who he called on the same night that the pups were born, saying, your pup was just born. Um, I knew that Venus would be our pup the day after she was born. Um, it was all very quick. Um, and that's just, I think, 30 years of experience, um, knowing what a dog will look like based on the head shape when they are born, um, knowing how sports-wise, they will be able to perform based on the build of their body. Even though they don't look like dogs at that specific point in time, if you see a dog, if you see pups being born so often, and you see them develop for years and years, then one way or another your brain will connect the two, and that's kind of how it works for him. So he just knows what this thing will develop into. And that's how his, his brain works when it comes to breeding. So, um, and yeah, often times pups develop over time and breeders often select after six weeks of age. But I guess um, having bred with uh, for so long with such a tight lineage, um, knowing all the dogs behind them for so well, um, you kind of have a, a clear idea of what you're breeding anyways. There is not that much variation. So if you see a difference, the difference is quite clear and you know what to expect. Now, obviously there will be some mistakes or errors. I don't know if that has happened too often. Um, I don't think so. Um, and everyone I know who has a dog from this breeder um, with like looking at the behavior is very satisfied. So I don't, I don't think there's many mistakes. But as you know, these dogs are quite feisty anyways. Um, if you're looking into a sports dog, um, that's the type of breeder you should go to. Um, that's, that means there won't be any super quiet puppies. So um, it's, it might be a bit easier maybe. Um, they, are, they are not quiet pups. They show a lot of behavior straight away. So that's I think what makes it easier. I wouldn't have been able to done it to do it, but I do know I did see the differences. It's not like I couldn't. This it's basically my summary of their behavior, which made Marco decide uh, where to put the puppies. So yeah, that's how it works. Um, I think Marco can explain this a lot better. So if he finds the time, I will ask him to tell me uh, how exactly he does it. But it's a lot. It, apparently it's a lot easier than it sounds. <laughs> he just knows. Alright, so that's it for today. I hope you like this. It's a very different video and there might be a little bit of footage, but probably not a lot of puppy spot stuff. But we'll be back on Thursday or Friday with another puppy vlog. Um, so if you don't like a talking video, then that's something that you will look at. I have to look out for. And uh, yeah. Uh, you'll be seeing this shortly after me filming it, so I hope you like it, and I will see you again next week. Goodbye!